Welcome to season three of the Balanced Voice podcast. If it's your first time, we're so glad you found us. The Balanced Voice is a podcast powered by Crime Stoppers of Houston and hosted by our CEO, Rani Mancarios. We're a podcast for the community, by the community, and we have a mission to facilitate balanced conversations that offer real solutions about today's most pressing issues. Through these conversations, we aim to educate, empower, and equip our listeners to become active participants in local and national public safety initiatives. I'm the executive producer, Sydney Zyker, and it is my pleasure to welcome you for a field trip that Andy, our director of victim services, and I got to take to New York. Today's guest could be disturbing to younger audiences, so viewer discretion is advised. Without further ado, here's your host, Renya Mancarios. Welcome to season three of the Balanced Voice podcast. We're so glad to be back with you all. We have an exciting season planned. And um, I don't even know, a very interesting first show for you, a premiere show. So uh, Crime Stoppers team, Andy Kahn, Director of Victim Services, is with us today. Andy, welcome, welcome. Thank you, Peter. Um, our executive producer, Sydney Zyker, is with us today. Sydney, welcome, Hi. welcome. Um, and they are going to take us on a field trip. <coughs> They're going to take us to New York City, where the two of them went to the New York Department of Corrections to have a historic face-to-face -face meeting with David Berkowitz, also known as a son of Sam, a serial killer um, that took the lives of many. And it's very odd for us to be doing this, but it's actually not. Um, so we're going to actually start with our Andy Kahn, who coined the term murderabilia in 2001. Yep, correct. Has uh, authored legislation and done a lot to ensure that those who commit murder don't profit from... Um, don't basically profit from crime. They can't sell the personal goods. Anything that's attached, yeah. So, Andy, take us back. You, okay, walking one into Andy Kahn's office is both um, terrifying and exciting. He has letters and things from serial killers and murderers that uh, he's collected through the years. He's written many, many letters. Actually, I was going to say love letters. Oh, God, no. Many letters, not well, squelch, love letters. Squelch that rumor right now. <laughs> yes, not love. No, but many yeah, letters right. to some of the most notorious ser serial killers. And you've actually created relationships with them, one of which being with David Berkowitz, who you met for the first time when you went to New York just a few weeks ago. But talk to us about how you got into this industry and created you know, these relationships. I grew up in, in mostly upstate New York and it was the fall of 1999 and I was perusing through a paper and it had a little blurb about a New York serial killer's art privileges being rescinded. New York uh, prison officials discovered he had artwork for sale on eBay and they shut him down. And I was, I'm going, wait a second, okay, if there's one, there probably is others. Now, I went over to eBay and this is 1999, you know, and just clunked the search in for serial killers and all these items came and I was looking at it going, wait a second, you can't be doing this. You can't be making money. You can't be profiting off of committing some of the most horrific crimes known to mankind in this country. This can't be legal. So I was instantly mesmerized, dumbfounded. And like most people, I thought you can't be profiting from crime. So I reached out to eBay's public affairs person. He, he got to know me rather well for the next few years. And I said, and he very succinctly put it to me exactly like this. He said, you know, Andy, we're not the morality police. As long as it's legal, we have an obligation to offer to our customers. And you don't like it, feel free to do something about it. And I just said, okay. I'll do something and about it. The challenge, the gauntlet was thrown. I accepted the challenge and have been on this since the fall of 1999. And in doing that and ensuring passing legislation to make it illegal for those who commit crime to profit from um, their criminal be acts through selling whatever. I mean, it's actually really s shocking to think that this happened or that there was a market for it. But this, apparently yeah, this was basically an underground market that, of course, with the Internet made it through mainstream America and, of course, all over the world. So you had this side industry. And so I made up this, uh, I guess, a cool, catchy name for it, murderabilia that kind of caught on. And basically what it was in a nutshell, you had serial killers, mass murderers, school shooters, high profile murderers that had name recognition, which shipped items out, personalized items like letters, autographs, pictures, hair all pieces of their closing, whatever, you name it, anything that can be attached with their was then put out to third party who then post them up for sale. 
So you had all these different auction sites, you know, besides eBay that were selling these items. And that that's kind of where it came from. And I became of the opinion, you know, for full disclosure, I, I was became an active buyer in, in the market. I felt it was important. I could print this stuff out all day long. But to actually have Charles Manson's hair or a California singer, serial killer's fingernail clippings or a piece of John Wayne Gacy's shirt or letters from the railway killer and pictures and all sorts of artwork from the happy face, I felt it was more powerful impact. So you reached out to David Berkowitz? I did. About two years into researching the industry, I became of the perspective that perhaps a lot of the killers might not even be aware their stuff was being sold. And I did what any good investigative amateur journalist that I portrayed myself as, and I just went fishing. I, I sent out 20 letters all across the country. Picked up Sir, his name was one of them. I was very upfront who I am, what I do. I attached printouts of stuff being sold with their names. I had a little checklist for them. Hey, are you making any money? Yes or no. Are you aware of it? Yes or no. Do you want to talk to me about it? Yes or no. What are your thoughts about it? And I, I, you know, 12 of them responded of the 20. One of the two that really stuck to me, one of them was David Berkowitz. The letter he wrote me, and I I have all his letters because this go back to 2001, and he at the end of the letter, which he was adamantly shocked that people were selling his stuff, and he was just dumbfounded. And he said, "Is there? Any, let me know if there's anything you, I can do to help you. And I'll never forget that line. And I just went, you know what? Let's see. And he, one of the first things he sent me was a notarized statement condemning the industry, saying he never gave anybody permission to sell his stuff, and it was adamantly opposed. that he sent you okay. way back in the day. And this is your original letter. Oh, it's interesting. Letter. Things I forget about over time. I can't. Oh, I have to go back. <laughs> you go, sir. Yeah, okay. Well, I was happy to respond back. You know, you had something that uh, piqued my interest because I'm thinking stuff for sale, what kind of stuff for sale. And so, uh, you know, I really appreciated that. It was an eye-opener for me, too. I didn't realize the extent of, of what was going on because I'm, I'm shut up behind prison walls. Yeah. And um, none of my friends who my correspondent with were aware of that. So it was really an eye-opener that uh, there was so much of that selling going on. I'm just curious. Were you receiving, do you know, do you remember if you were receiving a lot of letters at that time? Or was Andy's kind of... Well, I get, I get a, a, a fair volume of yeah. mail, not as much as the media. Always says because they over they exaggerate, but I do get a, a, a regular flow of mail, okay. uh, and uh, most of it is, is very good, very positive, very encouraging. Uh, and uh, Andy's, you know, stood out, and no one really ever told me about that before that I that I know of. There there are people that would write time to time and ask me to. They'll send an index card and say, please sign this or something and, and uh, stuff like that. And I wouldn't do that. I just discard those letters. Sometimes they'll send pictures, photos of, of me from the arrest that they get off the one off line online or something. And I just uh, discard all that. I still get a lot of that stuff. In fact, the more yeah, the more the more shows that come on TV with the crime mm-hmm. shows. Yeah. Of, uh, yeah, kind of every time there's a new show or something, yes, you yes, get an yes, influx. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So with this new Netflix, did you get an influx of letters? Yeah, this was the most ever, actually. Before we get into Sydney and your time in New York, just remind everybody, Son of Sam, what was he famous? David Berkowitz, better known as the Son of Sam, because... If you're a serial killer, you got to have a catchy nickname. We know Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, you know, John Wayne Gacy, the killer clown. Jeffrey Dahmer was a cannibal. We all know who these people are. So that it's a nickname that's given. Berkowitz murdered six people in what's called the Summer of Sam in 1976. And he held New York City hostage. He murdered six, wounded seven. And to use his own words, he said he's, he's lucky that more pe- you know, people, he was a bad shot. That's why more people weren't killed. Mm-hmm. So all of his victims were shot 
for yes. the most part. Yeah, everyone um, was shot, and they were primarily couples sitting in cars. He would go around throughout the city, get into his car, and you know, back in seventy six, seventy seven, you know, a lot of times young young people who were dating or you know in love, whatever, went in their car and and sit and do whatever you do in a car, and he would just come up and randomly shoot you and leave. There was that was it. There was nothing else done. There was no robbery. There was no such. He would just randomly shoot, and. It started getting a lot of attention for obvious reasons, and then no one knew what was happening. And he held this city in hostage, basically. You had an entire city that was scared. You had women, because it was mostly had longer hair, you had women that cut their hair. Just to not draw attention. Just to, to not be, uh, you know, uh, thought, sought out. Mm. By Berkowitz. So he paralyzed an entire city for over a year. Okay, so you've been now corresponding with him for 20 years. Andy's been corresponding with David Berkowitz, and you decide to go visit him um, in New York, the Department of Corrections. Why? And then why did Miss Sidney, why did she join you? You know, the fact that we have actually been corresponding for 20 years is just surreal to begin with. I mean, I never in my wildest dreams thought that this would continue, but it has. And he's been an enormous help to me. He's been a tremendous asset to me. And yeah, I get it. This is about as strange as an alliance as you could possibly imagine. One of the nation's most notorious serial killers actually working for a victim advocate in Houston. You can't script this. It's, you, you, you couldn't write this up. But it's real, and it's been happening, and it's been happening for over 20 years. The reason he's so valuable to me is, as you can imagine, in my position, I can learn about what items are, but how, do, how, do, how does it come about? Mm. How do people reach out to serial killers? How does it start? How do you, in other words, almost like a sex offender who grooms victims, and that's how. So because he's so well-known, he's the son of Sam, he would get, you know, a lot of requests for items. And you know what he does with all those requests? Ships them to me. Mm. I get to see behind the scenes because of him. And I'll give you an example. There was a company in Ohio, and they were, believe it or not, developing a serial killer greeting cards for sale. (laughs) Can't make that up. And they sent Berkowitz a prototype because they wanted his approval. For, before they marketed the serial killer greeting card. And Bert, he shipped the entire packet to me. So I got to know from the inside up. It doesn't get any better from when, whom you have, where all the profiting laws are named after, i.e. the son of Sam laws. Yeah. It doesn't get any better when you have the son of Sam actually working with you yeah. on that. You, like I said, it's, there's no way you could write a Hollywood movie about that. So you were going to New York to to just visit him? You know, here's reality, Rania. The, the era of serial killers is pretty much over and done with. And I'll, and I'll tell you several reasons why. Uh, the serial killers that were, quote, popular in the true crime vogue in the 70s and the 80s and maybe even a little bit in the early 90s, you know, they were extremely well known. I mean, and because they got away with their crimes for years, you didn't, and it, it's, you, so you're not going to have serial killers who are going to go around doing, having a body count throughout the years a- anymore. And it's, it's mainly because of one word, and that's technology. Mm-hmm. The technology has improved so much. You yeah. can't get away. You can't because one jurisdiction doesn't know that they had, you know, some bodies. You know, that's not going to happen anymore. So that era is over. Sadly, what's in turn replaced it are your mass murderers yeah. and your school shooters. But the era of serial killers is over, and most of the known serial killers have pretty much died out. <clears throat> there really is. So Berkowitz really is the last big name in that genre. And so because I've been going, after, I felt it was important to sit down with him in person. Mm-hmm. And I knew timing, it, it, I, for whatever reason, I felt it had to happen soon He's, he's getting up in age. Some would say I'm getting up in age <laughs> as well. So I knew we had to make this happen. And especially with all the COVID and the health and everything, the fact that we were able to put this together 
truly, to me, was to, like divine intervention. It, it was meant to happen. So, Sydney, you're um, our executive producer. You're also our safe community man manager. You're also doing a master's degree. You are recruited by Andy to join you on a flight to New York to go visit, you know, again, this notorious siller, serial killer and what would be a very, I imagine, a very traumatic place to go. Walk us through all of that. What did you feel? What was it like going to the New York Department of Corrections when you met him? What was that like? Yeah. So, you know, Andy and I work very closely. Our jobs overlap a lot. Um, my role in safe community is to kind of track crimes in Houston and nationally, and then figure out what we can do as a community to keep ourselves safe. You know, that coupled with my school program, um, which is in legal and forensic psychology, I've really paid a lot of attention to the calls for prison reform. You know, we have the highest incarceration rate in the world. And through my job, I get asked all the time, well, why are we throwing people in jail? Why are we throwing people in prison? And so for me to be able to talk to someone who is arguably the worst of the worst, I mean, kind of the last serial killer alive was something that I couldn't turn down. Um, it's something that I think not everyone is interested in doing. Like it's, it's people look at me like I'm crazy when I, when I'm like, okay, I'm really interested in talking to this man because I think that we have to learn things from people from all different walks of life. So I kind of been listening to and reading and kind of helping Andy with some letters back and forth to Berkowitz for a while. Um, and then when he offered for me to go with him, I was very interested. So the process getting into a prison, you know, first we thought we would just go and have a conversation, just the three of us, me, Andy and David Berkowitz. Um, and then I thought it was important to do this for the podcast, talk to you about it. I think that it's important to show what this person looks like, what this level of criminal looks like, mm -hmm. and how we can learn from them. We always have to keep learning. So we asked. <laughs> we weren't sure that we were going to get a microphone in. We weren't sure that we were going to get a camera in because David Berkowitz had been writing us, you can't even bring in a pencil. Yeah. So um, we made a call. And within what an hour, they called us back. I was startled. It was, I couldn't believe it how was quickly crazy. And you know, Andy and I have both been to Texas prisons, and they're very locked down. They're they're very scary, to be completely frank. Um, and so for the New York Department of Corrections to call us back and, and say, "Okay, what do you want to do? Why do you want to do it?" And I think that our unique perspective and Andy's long term relationship, saying, "Hey, this man has helped us." better our society, better lives for victims, and that kind of thing. They were very receptive to us coming in. It was a long process. I had to go back and forth about what equipment I was allowed to bring in, um, what I wasn't. Can't bring anything that connects to the internet in any way, so nothing with a Wi-Fi chip even. And so that was interesting. Um, and I think we were both unsure of how it was going to be when we got there. And so I remember us driving up um, the morning of the interview and pulling up, there's actually two prisons as you pull up. One on one side, that's Wall Kill. And it's scary. It's scary looking. And then you kind of keep driving. You think driving. about the name of the town yeah. that we were in, Wall Kill. I know. Yeah, <laughs> Wall Kill. And he, Berkowitz had already told us, that's not the prison. Don't go to that one. He was very particular about that. And so we kept driving. And then there's this little, I don't know, unassuming building with not much around it and just the parking lot we got out we started walking up and the i'll never forget it the guard who was up on like the watch stand hi guys <laughs> waved so down to us crazy and he's like you check in right over there it was like a scene out of andy griffith or mayberry yeah that and is. And it was come. so interesting we walk in there's not really anyone around and then this one guard comes out of the restroom he's washing his hands hi guys who are you here for and we're like david berkowitz oh yeah we've been waiting for you he came over he brought me a table to lay all my equipment down they asked us what would be best for the interview what kind of room it was interesting it was all very welcoming um at least from my perspective from going to a prison do you agree yeah, I mean, when you think of prison, you think of bureaucracies. You think of something you see out of a movie, you know. With 
these guys were as, as nice you, and you congenial. Like chaos almost to some degree, or screaming, or like frustration, right. or, yeah. or you know, kind of like a dragnet type of talking. But they were they were extremely friendly, open, professional, and. I, I was really struck by their demeanor Absolutely. towards us. It was one of the nicest experience. Is <laughs> not saying That's experience, but going bizarre. to a prison, it's That's normally bizarre. not it's like very that. bizarre. But it was like from the moment we arrived, it just all of your nerves just settled because it was almost like it was supposed to be. Um, and so we go into this room. They're like, "Set up whatever you want." We called him already. He's ready. He'll come down whenever. And you're, I'm thinking he's going to come in in like shackles or yes. something. And he's- he almost, so I say, we're ready. And he comes in and he's almost like shuffling and he has this like little folder of things he wants to show us in his teeny tiny New Testament Bible. And he comes in, hi, and we shake hands. We're allowed to be this close to him, touch him. Kind of like we're sitting right now, basically. Yeah. This is how we work. Like if you were him and yeah. Andy was over there and I'm and over here. And he's not shackled or anything. No. He's just, ha- he's just walking mm-hmm. down. Just to walking you. down as if you were coming in the door right now. And you could tell he was a little bit uneasy with the equipment. And so we talked about that. And then I just sat him down and I said, um, thanks for talking to us. I'd like to mic you up. And I remember that was like the moment that I was most nervous to to touch the serial killer. <laughs> so I have this mic and I'm like, I'm just going to clip it on you really fast. And I like clip it and I start it and I like sit down quickly. I'll bet you never in your wildest yes. dreams ever thought that you would end up micing a serial killer. That was just not in your things that I really want to do. Or you know, it's really not do. in my job description <laughs> either. I didn't sign off on that for Crime Stoppers, but it was um, interesting to then start the conversation with him. And we started just talking about, you know, his, his first experience. He first started in Attica, um, which is a very scary prison. I mean, not only for those of us who work in this field, but I mean, I study that prison in school. And so for him to talk about being in Attica and he kind of calmed down. He kind of just, it was almost like talking to, I don't know, an old person telling their life story. And so it kind of just went like that. We just had, what, a two-hour conversation? Over two-hour Over two hour conversation with this man. And he revealed a lot to us. He was very open, very honest with us. Um, and he kept saying, I just didn't know what to expect from this conversation. Mm. And I, I'm as I mean I just uh, in talking to Sydney when she came back she said it was almost like seeing somebody's grandpa just a grandpa which is so odd to think mm-hmm. about that somebody that can do so much harm and be so violent even if it's just a single gunshot but over and over take the life of people can turn into someone so non-threatening. Well, it's a very intimidating place. Uh, people, right. you know, if they ever saw the facility, uh, it's been, got a tremendous, it's got a terrible, terrible task. Yeah, there was a riot there in the early 69? 70s, which took, yeah. uh, I, well, I think it was early 70s, yeah. and it yeah. took many lives. Uh, 40, yeah. And uh, it's just a place where there's a lot of hopelessness and despair and uh, got a negative aura. <laughs> yeah. So coming there as, as, a, as a new Jack, for his first time in prison, it was quite an experience, you know. And, uh, but somehow, by the grace of God, I managed to adjust. Um, Andy, what did you think? You're finally meeting somebody you've been corresponding with for 20 years. You may have built up in your mind. You. Yeah, I mean, it was a surreal moment for me. I mean, here's someone, you know, we've been going back and forth, and, you know, he's been very open with me. I have, you know, letters he sent me. They're very candid about, you know, the crimes he committed. He was extremely remorseful in the letters. He's been consistent. He's never really asked me. For, I mean, the only thing he asked me to do was take some items off that <laughs> shouldn't have been up there for sale. So, and I, and I got to give, and I'm, I got to give a lot of credit to you for this because my initial thought process was I'm just going to go up there and we're just going to sit and I'm going to sit down with him. And then it took on a life of its own, which ended up being the best thing that ever happened. And having you know, Sydney come along with me, was it was a great tag team approach. And he took to 
Sydney immediately. I mean, we, you know, there was no surprises. We had, I had brought up the fact that my colleague would be coming with me and stuff, you know, so, you know, we kind of knew going in what we were going to talk about and banner about. Of course, it's still a moment where you're like, wow, I can't believe this is really happening. And I also get, because I know when this does, you know, air, I know there's going to be a lot of raised eyebrows. There are going to be a lot of dumb, <laughs> quizzical, like, you, I can't believe. Because when you think of me, this is, you're not, I'm about as hardball as you can get. It's just, you know, you know, or some people would portray me on the other side as Darth Vader or the Boogeyman mm-hmm. or whatever. And so I think for a lot of people, this this is going to come across very strange. But I also, at the same time, thought it was very important. And for me, we all know what he did. We all know his crimes. It's been done ad nauseum. But for me, what made him reach out to me and why... 20 years later, are we still going back and forth? And that's always, yeah. So I think that you've written us numerous times, really, Andy, numerous times about um, what you think your role is in helping with the murder of Belia situation. And we feel as if you've helped a lot. Okay. Um, well, thank you. What is your perspective? Well, for me, I think it's just uh, encouraging uh, Andy to continue on his cause because it's very, it's very good and noble. And uh, I know that there are a lot of people that are suffering, uh, you know, victims of crime or they're surviving, they're surviving um, family members when they, you know, see all this stuff constantly repeated or mar- all marketed and things like that. I'm sure it must hurt them greatly beyond even words. I can anything I can even understand. So, uh, you know, that's a good thing. Uh, and I always wanted to make you aware of these dealers and things to, you know. That's, that's really where you came about, in. But that yeah. was mainly my role. That was, just, your, that was yeah. your key for me because obviously I, I don't have none on the inside. Yeah. So I don't know mm-hmm. how they communicate yeah. and how they, you know, try to lure people in mm-hmm. and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And so that's where your help for me okay, well, I'm on the inside yeah. has been invaluable because I get to know who some of these people are, yeah. how they kind of, in a way, kind of groom, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. people yes, to they get have them. A, yeah. and, oh. and maybe even take advantage of your trusting personality. Yes, uh, yes it could be, could be, you know, I just accept things as they come. In fact, they even have a few more letters here <laughs> that I got recently. Goodness. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, that's, again, that's the way of, of society. You remember years ago, mm-hmm. and this is, and I tell this story, you, you got a letter, a, a packet from a company called Morbid Curiosity Shop. In okay. Ohio, okay. And they were developing serial killer greeting cards. Oh. Okay. They sent one to you, mm-hmm. and they wanted your approval mm-hmm. or thumbs up, and mm-hmm. you mailed the entire package to me. Sure, I didn't want it. I don't no. want to touch anything like that. Right. You know? That was. I mean, yeah. I can't imagine what it must be like for you when you get something mm-hmm. like that. I mean, what is your? I mean, get something in the mail like that that has yeah. your picture or something on it in a manufacturer well uh, it, it's disheartening mm-hmm. because I, I don't think these people you know they have their agendas and whatever they want to do but they really don't understand the, the, the horror of, of the whole Son of Sam case and, and, and other crimes as well that happen throughout society, the pain victims go through. To them, it's like, it's, it's not like you take it as a joke or anything, but you don't really realize the depth of suffering certain people have. And I feel that as a, as a person who is repentant and remorseful, I, 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 I don't like that. It, it's disheartening, it, it, it hurts, but I don't have anger towards these people, but I realize that they're just kind of lost, they, you know, and they're, you're just enamored by the, the culture of the crime shows and things like that, which is, you know, it's entertainment and it grabs a lot of people's interest. But as far as myself, I'm really detached from all that. I see that, I, you know, look at that. It was a recent, not that long ago, there were those little cards, those little, like, uh, small cards of the faces of different... Uh, like trading, like the, like the baseball cards? Yeah, sure. You remember? Yeah, 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 yeah right. Uh-huh. And, 
yeah. 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 and it even had the address of yeah. the two people that were manufacturing them, yeah. and they were, that was a hot item for a while. People were sending them to me, in fact, strangers were sending them to me, please sign this and send it back. <laughs> right into the well, you're some sort of baseball player. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it was just, um, you know, it's just the way it is. I'm watching you guys interact, and it's. I, I know that many people will feel this is a very strange relationship. I mean, Andy hasn't talked much about your relationship over the years, but what would you say to somebody who thinks that this is odd for, you know, someone like yourself to, to work in such close conjunction with someone who has devoted his entire life to advocating for victims? Uh, well, I, I, I would say that in regards to what happened with me in the past, uh -huh. which I'm so very sorry for, you know, I'm still a human being. He's a human being. We have feelings, we have emotions, we have concerns, I have regrets. And uh, I feel that it's, it's the right thing to do. And we hit it off because we're two Jewish guys, so right away that day. He right makes that joke all the time. <laughs> I did. I, I remember it's telling my late mother, who, you know, from White Plains, and, hmm. and I said, hey, Mom, we're just uh, two New York Jewish guys talking. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. The only difference is I'm a Jew who believes in Jesus. Right. So, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. no, but seriously, yes. we are, we're just from, you know, kind of similar backgrounds or something, I guess. And. Uh, you know, I don't like what's being done, but uh, you are, of course, on the front lines, and I just, I'm just just a recipient of, of these kinds of things. So he walks in with his small New Testament, New Testament Bible. Um, he's not threatening. Uh, what he he's, doesn't know about the latest in technology. I mean, has he been talking to victim families? Has he said sorry to victim families? What, what were some of the things you were, was there anything shocking you learned from him? Um, well, he does actually have technology, which was shocking to me. He has every inmate at his facility has their own tablet. So we did ask him about what it was like to learn technology from inside the walls of a prison. And so on one hand, he knows some of it. And then there were some things um, that were just crazy for him to say. Like at the end, he goes, so you said this was going to be a podcast. What's a podcast? Mm. And so explaining that to him was very interesting. For many years, I was in the dark ages when it came to electronics, you know, and um, uh, just about maybe a year and a half ago, they finally allowed us to have these uh, small tablets where oh. I could email because that's how we stay in touch now. So you have your own or? Yeah, they each inmate okay. is assigned his own tablet, okay. and, but you don't have like regular internet access. You have to go to what's called the kiosk. Okay. And it's like a, a little machine, looks almost like a cash register, uh -huh. and you have to log in there. You plug in, log in, and uh, send out your emails, get new emails in, and, and things like that. You get family How photos. How did you learn how to do that? Uh, do trial and error. <laughs> More error than true. <laughs> so you and Andy learned the same way? Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> you know you can work a tablet. He yeah, can't work well, a tablet. Well, we we kind of come from different <laughs> planets because your planet is more technologically advanced than mine. We're still really behind, but you know, it's a start and the communications are, are really a help, helpful to me. We're able to communicate quickly when necessary. And I have friends even overseas. I can uh, have missionary friends in Taiwan, uh, really? you know, Great Britain and other places. And, we send uh, Belgium, we send emails in, in a day or so, and, you know, I'll give them prayer requests and greetings, they'll do the same with me, so it's welcoming to the modern world, slowly but surely. Still very behind, the tablets are even a little antiquated, but hey, it's better than nothing, I thank God for that. But I think kind of the most compelling things, at least for me, were him talking about his correspondence with his victims, do you agree? Yeah, I, and I, you know, I, I know obviously a lot about him because we've been doing it, but I, I, I did not know that he reached out or one of the victim's families who's very prominent and well-known because I've done shows with, with one of the families. I was not aware that there was a correspondence. Uh, Stacy Moskowitz, her mother, and I began to correspond. Oh. It's a, a long story how that started, but... Uh, I have her, actually have her original letters in my cell still, you know, just hanging on to them. Uh, we began to correspond. We also began to speak on the phone. Uh, okay. She wanted to come up and, uh, and and meet with me. How long ago was this? 
this was in uh, around 2000, 2001, 2002. Yeah. Okay. And um, uh, my friends, close friends, mm -hmm. wanted to help her, you know, bring her up. They visited her down in Florida. They wanted to help her get, because she was in Florida now, they wanted to help her come up to see me and everything. But unfortunately, another individual got wind of this and made a proposition to her for, for money. Because she was you know, by herself, and uh, he offered her a substantial amount of money if he could be the one when we meet in the visitor room, he could report it. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, the Department of Corrections will never allow anything like that at any rate. Right. Second of all, I, I absolutely refused to do that because uh, I tried to explain to her. Mrs. Moskowitz, I would love to meet you and, you know, we have so much to share. I want to tell you certain things. This is going to be uh, exploited. Yeah. So then did you stop corresponding with her after Well, she got angry. She got angry at me, you know. Um, but her letters were very beautiful about we were talking. Uh, she had three, you know, she, well, you wouldn't know the whole backdrop of the story, but she lost all three of her daughters, mm -hmm. tragically. Her, her youngest daughter, died in, in, I think, the early 70s, for the accident. Uh -huh. And then her oldest daughter, Stacy, of course, died in a crime of violence there. And But her middle daughter, Ricky, who was uh, with her, Ricky started to get sick. She had some, had developed some kind of disease. And so Mrs. Moskowitz was writing to me saying, look, please have your, your guys in the chapel praying for my daughter. My daughter's very sick. And I assured her that we would. This is when we were corresponding, of course. And, but she did, eventually did pass away, you know, so uh, she was left alone with the most, which is very I mean, sad. You must have been kind of shocked when you got, or kind of, I, I mean, if I'm getting a letter from, you know, I'd be like, kind of, oh my God, what's, <laughs> what's well, she, um, were you forewarned that she'd be writing you? Or, oh, well, like, this, is, this is, this is, a, a, yeah. this is a story. <laughs> you may have to spend a week here, you know, but you know, <laughs> this, is, this is a story. Um, uh, oh, I had uh, done an interview with the 700 Club. Mm. Uh, to tell your testimony. Yeah, yes. testimony. And this was quite a while ago, in, in the 1990s. I don't even remember. No, yeah, something like that. 1996, 1997, I can't remember when. And uh, so I was talking to one of the staff on the phone, and I said, um, listen, I would like to send a letter to this, uh, a mother of one of my victims. How, how could I could I send that to you, and that you could forward it with a cover letter or something like that? And she talked with her staff and everything, and it was all you know properly arranged. And I said, yeah, we'll do that. So I composed a, a short letter, maybe three or four typewritten pages, and I sent it to the staff member in, in the 700 Club, and, and they forwarded it to Mrs. Moskowitz. You know, and so uh, Mrs. Moskowitz, when she got it, that was my apology letter to her. When she got it, she called up a friend of mine because she, a friend of mine, uh, this woman Gail, Gail, Gail and her husband Rex, had a, a big fondness for Mrs. Moskowitz, you know, all the suffering she went through. Mm -hmm. This is years after the crimes and everything. And so they reached out to her. But, but that was it. She never really responded. But when she got my, my, my letter, she called them. She, she, how she knew, I'll tell you, this is the hand of God. How she knew that that person would somehow have information about this, this letter. <laughs> and so Gail and Rex, they hit it off with her. And so it, we ended up corresponding with Mrs. Moskowitz and I, talking on the phone a few times. And my friends uh, from Georgia spent time with her. They go down to Florida, hang out with her, and they really hit it off. But uh, you know, so, there was so much healing and everything. Unfortunately, someone put their hands in it and kind of muddied the waters. Right. But uh, you know. But you do feel like there was healing before that happened, before that incident. Yes. Yes. I, I, you know, you could see her letters. You would see that oh. she was really uh, a good. You know. Uh, it was really a miracle. I don't know. I don't know. It's a, it, it's such a long story, but it's. Uh, it's and she's were, the only one. She's the only one that you corresponded with. Oh uh, well, I now a little bit. I'm, I'm corresponding with one uh, guy who was injured, but uh, we we email one another. 
Okay. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a touch and go. He wants to uh, meet with me, and, you know, he's ready. It was his what desire, so when he's ready, he'll let me know. And it's, you know, we we're on, I guess, kind of good terms. So, so if you ever get to meet him face to face, how do you think you'll feel? Uh, it will be a blessing and an honor. I have things to share with him. Uh, I feel we give each other a big hug, you know. Yeah. And there's a, few, a lot of positive things would come from that, but that's still a work in progress. You know, I think that talking to him about his correspondence with his victims, that whole relationship, how it has had quite an arc, actually, um, was something that I was interested in to ask him about from the beginning. And when he just kind of came out with it, I was shocked that he was so willing to openly talk about those relationships and the ebbs and flows of those relationships. Um, I also found it incredibly interesting to see him physically. Um, I'm sitting on this side of him. And so on this side of his neck is this giant scar from an altercation he had early, early in his prison days. And Andy didn't even see it, didn't even know he had it until afterwards when I brought it up. But um, he told us about a, someone trying to kill him in prison in Attica at the beginning. And his thoughts and his perspective on how he thinks that that saved his life in the long run. Why? were really interesting. Yeah, but I was in Attica for about three years. I also got caught in Attica where, you know, a guy tried to take my life. And he didn't really... What was, was just, the purpose of him trying to take I guess just to make a name for himself. Like, but, you know, that's just the way it goes. Yeah, I was going to ask you because obviously, yeah. because of your high profile status, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure you read about her, you know, like somebody like Jeffrey Dahmer, who's in general. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Another inmate, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. took his life, and that's what he's known for. Yeah. As a result yeah. of that, so I'm sure you must have been. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, it was it was uh, intimidating, but it turned out uh, in a strange way to be a kind of a blessing in disguise, because uh, I didn't, you know, give up or we'll squeal on the guy who did it. I kept my mouth shut, and uh, I know it sounds, you know, people. Say, but that's the way it was. So after, uh, for weeks, the, the uh, correctional personnel and even the New York State Police were, were questioning me, really me, who did this, who did this, mm. and I wouldn't give up the guy's state. Yeah. So in the long run, what happened was all the guys in the prison, the word was out that I was a stand-up guy. That, you know, yeah, that I got their respect. That, you know, and, and, and then it, it, it totally changed the whole uh, atmosphere for me, like doors open. Did you ever see the guy who was standing there again? Yeah, I did, yeah. yeah. But he, about a, for about a week, then he was transferred out. He was transferred. Yeah, and, uh, you know, and so, I was very fortunate, very fortunate. He, he missed my carotid artery by just a hair's breadth. And had he struck that, uh, I would have, would be here today. But uh, and like my friend Rick said, many a, a decade later, you know, God wants, has his hand on my life and I, I see the reality of that now, you know. I can't thank God enough. When you guys, you, you say that he lived a relatively successful life in prison, mm -hmm. this is what you mean, knowing how to navigate the culture, prison culture? Um, I would say it's maybe that. For me, mm -hmm. I think that it's more of that he has made a life for himself. He's he's relatively joyful as a person, which is, it was very shocking to me. I knew that he would be very meticulous in his words based on his letters. Every word that he chooses is Measure. Very measured. Um, and he even has called Andy out on words in the past <laughs> yeah. for interviews that he's done. So I knew that that would be the case, but I didn't expect him to be so precise about what he does for his job inside prison. He talked about how he loved his job. He's an elder in his church and within the prison. And, and um, he works for the chapel. He's like the clerk or something for the chapel. Um, and so I think those things... Um, coupled with his willingness to help Andy, he's also very interested in helping younger offenders or juvenile offenders not become like him, basically. And so I think that in showing that he wants to better society, even from within prison, 
were out of prison. Um, and him learning to make a life for himself within the prison environment to me shows that he's relatively successful. I mean, he's the last man standing when it comes to serial killers. So he's something that he's yeah, done. I mean, I think if you think about it, just objectively, here's someone who has spent 44 years now, goes in as a 24-year-old, wide-eyed, you know, son of Sam killer. How does he go from that to where he is now? That's what fascinated, I think, both Sydney and I. How do you, how do you overcome the, the changes? How do you go from being that type of person to where you are now? How do you survive? For me, my, my thing is reaching out to youth through, youth. through the writings. Uh, I recently did some journal entries on, on gun violence because that's a big thing now in the city. It's, it's, a, big, it's a big epidemic, epidemic and uh, you could read them any time. You know, you just go on, online to the uh, Rise and Shine. Rise and Shine. Yeah. I have a funny story about that. I'll tell you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I, I try to get messages out. I've, for years I've been writing. Not every day, but every so often I have an opportunity to speak to a youth group. I have friends in, in Yakima, Washington, who... How do to you me. speak to them? Huh? How do you speak to them? Is it... Uh, oh, a letter, 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 okay. letter, and email. email. Email, yeah. And they can go into a juvenile detention facility. It's pretty big mm -hmm. uh, for, for, for many years. And they share my testimony with some of the... Explain the background, because these kids weren't even born, you know. These are all out-risk kids, and so, uh, but they, you know, they share the price with them and try to get them on the right track and things like that. So I get the chances to share little messages and things like that, you know. Yeah. Do you, do you feel like people who have committed multiple violent offenses can still better society um, and be reformed in some way, even from within prison? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Sure. Uh, some of the guys here, uh, they further their education as, you know, as best as they could. One of the things I've, I've, I've encountered, you know, because uh, for whatever reasons, you know, a, a lot of guys will uh, uh, kind of seek me out because they know I'm involved with the chapel and things like that. And I'm always trying to encourage people as best I could. And, you know, we have like our little walks in the yard and little talks, and many of these guys will tell me, you know, just how, how much regret and sorrow they have. Mm -hmm. like they put up in the gangs when they were like 19, 18 years old. They end up coming to prison for 40 years, 50 years, and, uh, you know, they have to keep up this macho role, but when they're, when they're with me, they'll tell me, you know, Dave, uh, man, I, you don't know how much I regret this. I said, bro, I hear you. But, the same thing, you know, yeah. and uh, you know these guys have messages for for, for a younger generation, and uh, they they really want to do good. They wish they could, you know, in some ways do good. They try to help out their families and things like that. So I mean, he's been to three or four prisons too, and that was interesting. One of the stories he told us is how he, because I knew he was in one facility for a long time because that's how we would I would get letters from Sullivan, and then all of a sudden he's in this facility that both Sid and I, we, I think we finally finally learned how to pronounce Shawana Gunk. I don't know that that's uh, it because whatever. all we the guards say it differently. Gunk. We call it, they <laughs> the call gunk. it the gunk. Okay. Yes. Uh, so how do you, you know, how do you do that? And so that to me, fascin it was fascinating to me learning from that aspect. Why did you, why from Attica to Clinton? I mean, how does that work? What, well, was it uh, a request of transfer? I mean, how do you? Yeah. Well, the Department of Corrections uh, did uh, transfer me because at the time I did get into a, a bad scuffle with somebody and ended up in, in the box. I did three months in what's called the box. Okay. And uh, so after that, after my time was up on that day, they put me in a van and sent me to Clinton. But I did very well in Clinton. I was there for a while, and then. Uh, when they opened up Sullivan Correction Facility, which was new, they sent me there. That was their choice, uh, you know, I, and uh, I was in Sullivan for about 28 years. Okay. Yeah, 28 and a half years. So and you then, were at Sullivan right when it opened? Uh, about two years after. Two years after. Yeah. Okay. And 
and uh, so how do they how do they tell you you're sitting you get you're up one day and all of a sudden yeah that's the way it works yeah that's the way it works i was in in, in uh, my cell i had off that morning and i was in my cell in, in um uh, sullivan and the officer came to me the officer knew me well because i had been there so long he says hey dave you're not going to believe this, but the, the draft room, that's where they, where they transfer people to call draft. The, the draft room, well, they, you got to pack your stuff, you're going on a transfer. And I said, really? He says, yeah. He says, I can't believe it, they, you're going on a transfer. So to make a long story short, I had to gather all my things, I gave things away, said goodbye to who I could in the block. Yeah. And later that afternoon, I was on, on a van to, to where I am now. So it's just like was that. that were you at all happy to be transferred or were you a little oh well, and you know i was so I, I was in the other facility for so long yeah and i had made so many good friends especially from the church group where we became bonded like a brotherhood you know yeah of, of, of believers and, and i knew their families i met their families and different events that we family day events we have and so to, to, to suddenly have to be yanked away plus i was i was there i was like functioning as the inmate pastor they have, of course, the chaplain who's the real pastor, but unofficially, I was the inmate pastor because I had to oversee the services and I was You're doing very that for a long time. Uh, I don't know. 25 years. Yeah, you, yeah you, I mean, you were. That was your, that was your life. That decades. was your, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. And, um, and uh, so then it was, it was hard to move, just get uprooted suddenly, not even have a chance to say goodbye to them. So from the time they told you to the time you moved, how long was that? Uh, several hours. Hours? Yeah. yeah. Oh my yeah, goodness. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, they, sh they told me about 10, 10, 30 in the morning when the call came to the cell block. And by 2 o'clock, two, something like that, 2.30, I was on my way, packed up, and in a, a little van on the way to this place. Yeah. Did you know anyone else that was Oh, actually, no, I didn't. I went by myself. But when I got here, I met some guys that I knew from Sullivan. Okay. And there was also, there's also a, was a strong Christian group here. So I was, I ended up in the same cell block as some of the other uh, men who were like elders of, of the okay. church. So we all hit it off right away and I got, I got situated and up with no problems. I've been here a little over five years now. Five years. About five, five and a half years, yeah. Is there ever any fear that you'd get transferred again? That's always a possibility, yeah. <laughs> it's true, I mean, I, you know, you have no say so and it's, it's in the, in the Lord's hands, but uh, I'm doing well here, and I thank God for that. So he's remorseful, and, and as a society, we I mean, that's the question of forgiveness and, you know, what do you do with people like this that have committed some of the most horrific crimes and do serve a to their sentence, but where is where does just punishment end? I mean, should he be out, or has the system really worked in his case and helped him be the best person he can be? which is within the confines of that prison. I, I don't know the answer to that. That's the question that I, that I left with. That was my biggest takeaway was, you know, first of all, we have to, as a society, decide what is the purpose of punishment and imprisonment. Is it solely to force someone to pay their debt to society, take the life from them that they've taken from someone else? Is it an eye for an eye? Is it some kind of reform? Are we hoping to take even the most violent of offenders and, I don't know, implement systems that allow them to be successful on the outside? Or is it acknowledging that sometimes some people are most successful on the inside? What is the most humane option for everyone? But I don't think there is one answer. No, I don't think that there yeah. is either. But I think that those are all things that we grapple with. Yeah. And so for him, at least what I saw is that this incredibly controlled environment has been successful for him. Um, he has had good community. He feels like he's giving back. I mean, he did bring up some things about possibly wanting to be out. But, um, you know, I don't. I also don't know how successful he would be on the outside. I mean, would people try to murder him? I don't know. So... That was where I was just, my thoughts have lingered for since the, the interview is, what is the most humane thing to do with this person? And why is he in New York where he's still alive? I mean, in Texas, Yeah, and we he talked about be. that. If he, you know, if he had committed these crimes in Texas, we wouldn't be talking today. No ifs, ands, or buts. So 
you know, and I think he recognizes, you know, the fact that in other states he would be long gone. He would have been executed, and and rightfully so. So there, so there has to be a purpose for him. What is his purpose? And I think Sidney is absolutely correct. In a controlled environment, he thrives. This is where he needs to be, should be, and he will always be. There, he's, he's not, not going to get out. No, I cannot see. And there, there's, you are not going to parole. But yeah, he could. Yeah. But yeah. And what is what are what is his situation with parole? Yeah, and by statute, he comes up for every two years. And that's just because of the time period where he but, committed but the, the crime. The world has changed. I mean, I can mm-hmm. see where he would be released in today's culture. I kind of do too. And in a, in a state like New York, in a, in a city like Harris County, even California, with some of the Manson girls, whom the parole board actually approved for release, the governor has overridden their decision. Mm-hmm. I think it. If he hadn't been the son of Sam. And it had a name. People in forty-four years, we still know him. Yeah. Unless you got a, a career death, <laughs> or if you're a political and you, you don't want to get elected, you're not going to vote to release him. And, and plus, I can't see it happening. Wait, what did, would he know how to survive if he were released? I mean, how will he get a job? What would he do? So, if you were given the opportunity, or the, it was made possibility that you could get out, would you be interested or no? I would definitely be interested. Yeah. You know. Not, not anything deserving it or anything like that, but the chance to just reach out to more people than ever before. And what, how would you do that? What would you do? Well, I mean, first of all, the re- parole restrictions, let's say, just for argument's sake, the yeah. parole restrictions, uh, like they are for everyone, very res- very strict and important. And uh, would, of course, be constantly monitored. But I would love the chance to be able to use the internet to share messages to mm-hmm. the different youth groups and schools and things like that. And also maybe a visit like juvenile detention center and mm-hmm. things. Because of my background, I think, uh, you know, it, that they would uh, be more inclined to listen to me and I could have yeah. a heart-to-heart talk with them. That's what I do with my, through my writings, but it would be even, I think, more effective if I met with them in person and we could talk and interact and things like that. But that's something that's in God's hands. I've never really made any effort for that, you know. Uh, and are you interested in making up any effort towards it, or uh, you don't feel like it's your place? Well, I'm, 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 I'm just waiting for direction from God. You okay. Know, I don't know really how to put it, but it's just something that, uh, you know, my dad, you know, my dad was such a wonderful man, and uh, he died in 2012. And his, he used to tell me all the time, David, the reason I'm staying alive is because I want to see you get out. And I said, Dad, okay, well, Dad, we'll see what happens. It's in all in God's hands. And uh, he, that made him hang on. He, he was 101 years old when he passed, yeah. yeah. Our dad, Nathan, yeah. <laughs> 101. 101? <laughs> My goodness. He, he stayed up uh, as long as he could, you know, hoping for the day. He couldn't understand why the parole board kept hitting me. He said, why, why did they keep hitting you? You know, two years, two years, three years. He says, you've been a model prison, you did everything they told you to do. He said, Dad, there's, there's a lot involved in, in the case, and he didn't understand that, because he was under the impression that if you behave yourself, yeah. you're rewarded with good behavior. <laughs> and, but I said, well, Dad, it's not, it doesn't work exactly like that. When you're out for parole, do you actually meet with the parole board in person? Uh, I have, I have at times. And a few times I said, I think I declined, and sent a letter, a letter, a short letter. You know, so. so, but you will you meet with them when you come up? I think you come up in 2022. Is yes, that correct? Yes, yes, yes. So you'll meet with them in person then. Oh, uh, I haven't decided yet. Okay. I haven't decided yet. And, uh, Do you feel like the parole hearings have gotten any more um, maybe open to releasing you? I, I wouldn't say that they uh, no. really. But because there's, there's so much involved, and I understand, you know, that they're doing yeah. their job. And yeah. I accept that. But I, they've become more, um, at the beginning, they were more hostile, you know. And uh, uh, now, but now they're, they're more like we have a, a, actually an edu- uh, a nice talk. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, hear me out and speak. You know, it's not like, a, you know, they're shaking their fist at me. So things have changed. 
but that's it in God's hands. So I, I know, you know, we're watching you guys talk to him and we're having this conversation, but I'm just curious, Andy, and you know everything about him, and I'm always fascinated by why people commit the crimes they commit. Mm -hmm. Why did he do this? What he's confided in me throughout the years, and this is pretty early in our conversation, a combination of uh, being on LSD and being part of satanic worship, mm. which is one of the reasons that put him back on the map again because of the Netflix series that tries to tie him into this uh, cult and pit, put some of the murders on that it wasn't just him as well. So he's become a mythical, larger-than-life character that still carries weight. I mean, you had a series that just came out on Netflix in May that was watched by millions, and it puts him back on the map again. And so because of that, then people reach out to him again. I mean, some of the letters that that I've shown you are just... <laughs> Bizarre. Bizarre. I mean, some of them will write to him saying, you're my favorite serial killer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what's so fascinating. You know, or they'll, they'll confide in him. But I also think that that's something that is a bit of a product of our culture. Yeah. I mean, we glorify mass murderers and serial killers and criminals. I mean, people are so interested in the crime world. And so it goes from, oh, you watch a TV show, oh, you read a book about it, to, well, let me just reach out to this serial killer. And I think that that is something that we all have to take into consideration. I mean, again and again in, in our programming here at Crime Stoppers, it's, hey, the victims are first. Let's not throw the criminal's name and yeah. face out there. Let's make sure that we are celebrating the life of the victim and mourning the loss of that victim. Our focus is on the victims and on community and on public safety. So what was your hope, guys, for this interview? I think it's, it's you know, important to understand that isn't he doing something you want somebody to do in prison? He's repentive. He's remorseful. He's trying to give something back to society. And yeah, I get it. And he's found a way to do that in me, of all places, particularly on the issue of profiting and glorifying serial killers. So He's doing what you want somebody to do. So, yeah, you can condemn him, sure, for every, you can blast him, but at the same time, this is what you want somebody who's an inmate to be doing, and that's offering, you know, to give back to society, and he's doing that. Absolutely. Um, for me, I think it reiterates the importance of community. Hmm. I think that he was a bit of a loner when he committed these crimes. He's on LSD. He's part of the satanic group and the importance of seeing people, all people, and welcoming them and making sure that we're reaching out. I think that we underestimate the importance of acknowledging your neighbor, acknowledging those around you and engaging everybody. I don't I can't say this enough times and I'm sure everyone's tired of me saying this, but it takes every single one of us in a community to keep us all safe. It can't just be those of us that, mm. that have this as a job. It has to be all of us. And even talking to arguably the worst of the worst, maybe on the planet, that is what I came back to is, okay, but we have to engage with every single person. No one can be left in the shadows. You know, the great thing about having uh, Sid with me was that she challenges me. Mm. And I'm not used to being challenged, but <laughs> that's just, so it was. It was great to have someone bounce things off and to kind of tag team this, and also kind of broaden my perspective into looking at him. Because yeah, I'm I'm, I'm a little probably a little bit more close to this, mm -hmm. and, and so she Sid was able to look at this on a more of an objective level. So it was a great team approach. And, you know, I, I think that you went in with a different perspective as me. You have this long relationship and you've over 20 years been able to kind of form an opinion. And I kind of came in thinking, even through my studies, thinking, I mean, he's a serial killer. Like, can he even have empathy is the question that I have in my brain all the time. 
Um, and like, this is great that he has written all these lovely things to you, but what is he really like? And is that just part of like uh, paroles coming up? Right, you know? exactly. I mean, he's up in 2022. So, I mean, is this almost a facade that he's kept for a long time? And I think talking to his guards was incredibly revealing to me. One of his guards goes, oh my gosh, he's so boring. And I was like, boring? He goes, always. He's exactly the same all the time and he's boring. What are they? What and I'm like, what? <laughs> he's like, yeah, like, I mean, he, how he was with you guys is how he always is. And I just expected, and he was talking about when he first came to this facility and became a guard at the facility, he was like, I kind of expected like meeting the son of Sam would be a lot more exciting than this. I was like, Okay, so, like, that's how he really is all the time. And that's telling to me. Well, it also goes back to your point that maybe the worst are those that are excluded, left out, mm -hmm. on their own, and appear boring. But they're just alone, mm -hmm. you know. This has been so fascinating. We hope you guys have enjoyed listening to this and, and uh, you know, I'm sure learned a lot from listening and seeing them on their field trip to New York with the son of Sam. Um, it's always important. This is a podcast for the community, by the community. Send us your thoughts, your questions, your comments. Um, rate us, follow us, share it, and we will see you next time. Thank you, guys. Thanks for tuning in to today's Balanced Conversation. You can find real solutions and tangible resources in our show notes at thebalancevoicepodcast.com. To join the conversation, follow us on Instagram at thebalancevoicepodcast and on Twitter at balancevoice underscore. Stay up to date on Renya's work by following her at the Renya Report. And we can't wait to see you next week for another Balanced Conversation.